and I'm going to start off here because I would say John's career path um, is very similar to my own in the fact that uh, I was around a lot of stuff, never got really good at it. So I would tell John the one thing he's probably qualified to do is to be a fine home building magazine editor. <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. It's the senior editor, Patrick McComb. I'm joined by deputy editor, Matt Milham. How's it going? Design editor, Kylie Jacques. Hello. And producer extraordinaire, Jeff Rose. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Uh, it's good to see you all, and uh, this this recording the show is one of the highlights of my week. I got to say, because hanging out with you people is pretty fun. I know I miss you guys too. Yeah, um, we got some great feedback on uh, recent episodes. I'm going to start right off with my favorite thing. So Homer uh, left a comment on our podcast page. So in episode 241, Matt talked about painting the pink tile in his formerly pink bathroom. <laughs> And Homer tipped us off to uh, SaveThePinkBathrooms.com, which, as you might imagine, is a website dedicated to the preservation of pink bathrooms from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And Gotta love it. Gotta love it. It's hilarious. So um, I encourage you all to check that out. But I learned that the um, trend with pink bathrooms came from Mamie Eisenhower, and it, pink was apparently her favorite color. She wore a pink gown with 2,000 sequins to Ike's inauguration. Hmm. Also pink. The sequins are pink. <laughs> of course. The, so, Matt, you were uh, destroying our country's heritage. I want you to know. <laughs> I'm happy to do it. Right. My, I support my, you. Se my senior year of high school, uh, my parents sold the house I grew up in, and we, we moved, I don't know, maybe a quarter of a mile to a smaller house that was built in either the 50s or the 60s i don't know but it had another it had a pink bathroom too and i was really the only one who used that bathroom so i mean, i hated that thing and i just could not you know we bought a house with another pink bathroom and you know i've you, you're like hated it ever and, since you're like mr pretty in pink you're red yeah. and surrounded by pink yep oh my god the tile's still there i mean if anybody wants to strip the paint off oh man so I don't know. There was an, I guess the page is updated pretty regularly. There was a number of posts on there, and and one of them tipped us off to a, a tile store that used to be in New Jersey that had um, old stock of these pink tiles. So if you had to do repair, you could you could match it. And uh, <laughs> it's a shame that's gone because <laughs> God knows you want to keep your pink bathroom intact, right? Yeah. It was funny, actually. I was looking up something, and I found, uh, like, a DIY video on Lowe's.com, or, like, on their website, and they were removing the same exact tile that I have in my bathroom. <laughs> Did you save it? Did you save that tile? Oh, it's still there. It's just Oh, painted that's right. You over. painted over it. That's right. You yeah. didn't remove any of it. Yeah. I, I also loved hearing from uh, Zachary. He writes, hello, FHB Podcast. Thanks for everything you do. Having you all continue your podcast and even add to it during this time has been a great reassurance. Thanks, Zachary. It's it's actually quite fun. Uh, in episode 241, your your first listener question at the at the end asked why designers insist on filling furniture with pillows. <laughs> well, I just wanted to let you all know that he is not alone in his dislike for too many pillows. In fact, there's a great Reddit page called Too Many Pillows <laughs> that has some examples that make you just wonder why. So, of course, I had to check this out, too, and this is all these, like, froofy rooms with too many pillows. It's so many that you can't sit on the furniture or get in the bed. <laughs> uh, so what have you guys been doing? Oh, man. Uh, we joined our two gardens into one, so basically redid all the fencing for that. That was a pretty big task. Um, I built a... Potting Wait a table. minute. Why did you, why did you have two gardens that were close enough to be separated by fencing? Well, <laughs> so we had initially built one garden, and you know that was a food probably garden, the, right? Yeah, it was a food garden. They're they're all food gardens, but it, it was just in a space that had good sun, and you know it was it was a good spot for it. We didn't want to do anything too big because we weren't sure exactly how much we'd be able to get out of it or or anything. Um, and you know, we're having to tr 
basically pick up all this soil ourselves. And, you know, it's like, how much stuff do you really want to move? So the next year I built, last year I built this garden shed and then we put another garden basically off of that. Right. And there was space in between the two, partly because there's a, a big swale that comes through because I live sort of in the middle of a, of a hill, I guess, a big slope. I live on a, on a, the road I'm on is called Ridge Road. And there's a reason that it's named that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so anyway, so there's this gigantic swale that sort of goes between the two gardens. And we decided that's not much of an issue and we'll just leave it there and uh, connect the two gardens and just kind of work around the swale. <laughs> mm. So that was, that was a bit of a, task mostly because i had built this gigantic uh sort of compost bin for all the leaves because we have about four acres and a lot of trees and so in the fall it's just you know like mountains and mountains of leaves so i built this big bin uh last fall and we put i don't know how many hundreds of pounds of leaves into it that are now wet and probably i don't know thousands of pounds of leaves <laughs> and so and if you're thinking like ah, oh, maybe we can just put some hand trucks under it and kind of push it along nope nope <laughs> so had to take everything out move it move the bin move the leaves back in the bin so that was fun what did you use for fencing material uh just galvanized well yeah it's mostly just galvanized five foot tall fencing Mm -hmm. It's enough to, it seems to be enough to keep the deer out. At least it was when it was two small gardens. We'll see if they, I'm sure they can jump over it. No problem. Yeah. I mean, my cats can, but it seems to keep them out as well. <laughs> what do you, uh, what do you do to keep the deer out? This, the fencing has been sufficient. I mean, like they're still it, wandering your yard, presumably. Yeah, it's been good enough so far. There's enough, mm -hmm. it, they seem to love to eat the flowers and the uh, every other plant. So yep. I don't know if that's enough to keep them out, um, especially in the fall, because we have quite a few apple trees. They'll eat those. So how about I've you, Kylie? What do you? Well, that deer comment made me think about my, the, I have an arborvitae hedge that's going to be the death of me, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, <laughs> I'm surprised that the deer don't come down because there's plenty of deer around and they, I didn't know when I planted it, shame on me, that uh, arborvitae is a tasty treat for deer. But luckily that's not an issue. But I, you know, the, the Frenchie in me really likes a green vertical line that's healthy. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I like hedges. And this one is 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 serving a, an important function. But, um, and they're expensive to plant those things, right? Each one is about 80 bucks a pop. So anyway, I've got about 15 North Pole arborvitae. And every year I... Um, uh, double dig and dethatch and re-edge and add soil amendments and remulch my whole hedge. And it's a lot of work, but it's worth it to me because I can't stand to see a dead, you know, someday it's going to pay off. So Carol calls arborvitae deer caviar. I know. I, oh. I'm surprised I don't have that issue. I've got other issues. I don't need that issue. What's, yeah. What are your yeah, other issues? <laughs> we had about yeah, they like that. They like that plant. I don't, I don't know yeah. why. I don't, there's plenty around here. They don't seem we to know about it. We had about 10 when we bought this house, and they were all chewed up to as high as the deer could reach. That's the worst and so basically, it was just like these little pointy tops yeah. and then these dead I hate like, that. stems below, and I could not wait to yank those out. Yeah, it, that's they, so terrible. They had tried. The previous owners had tried to keep the deer away from them by putting fencing around them and everything. And yeah. it just looked awful. That's and awful. The, they didn't go in and weed any of that fencing. So then poison ivy had just taken over everything. And so, you know, was... there's something about a healthy hedge. You got to put work into it. Yeah. People just assume you don't, you water it the first year, then you leave it alone. Uh-uh. The water's yeah. got to be able to get down into that root zone or you're going to wind up with that hedge. Mm -hmm. So it's going to kill me. It's going to be the death of me. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. I I think it's better that than something else, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Not a bad way to go. <laughs> what have you been doing, Jeff? Um, what did I do? Uh, I was trying to fix my wall ovens. What's Ooh. wrong with your wall ovens, Jeff? Um, <laughs> they're kind of weird. Um, they're, they're Bosch uh, double wall ovens. And as soon as you turn it on, there is a fan that kicks on that keeps the control panel cool. And the upper oven that fan is not working during normal bake mode. But if you turn it on convection bake, it works. So it's, so I'm trying to figure that out. 
What the heck? How do you figure that out? Yeah, well, it's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll let you know when I figure it out. <laughs> so we've still been working on Liam's room. Uh, we finished the painting uh, Sunday. Carol finished cutting in the baseboard. I put the baseboard up with Liam's help on Sunday. And uh, we started making furniture. Actually, we did that on Saturday. We started making the furniture on Sunday. So Liam's been helping me carry and handle sheets of plywood and then heavy cabinet boxes. But it's been a pretty successful project, I'd say. We've, I'll put some photos up on the podcast page for those of you who are interested. But we've been making uh, – we made a loft bed and a, cu- a cabinet underneath and a very tall headboard. Um, and I, here, hold on a sec. <laughs> Isn't this nice? Look at this. Ooh. Oh, <laughs> Veneer, maple plywood, pre-finished two sides. Whoa. That's one of your favorite products, isn't it? Oh, my God. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I have, I have a question about Liam's bed. I was looking at that photograph, and okay. I know it's not finished, but you guys are up inside of it. And so am I right to think that when he's lying down, he's not going to be able to see anything? It looks like it's tall. <laughs> Like he won't be able to see the light of day. Like, so the mattress is, is 12 Stop. inches. It is, it is a three sided box. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he wanted a wall on the open side of the loft bed. So his pillows and, and bedding didn't fall out, which mm-hmm. was a problem with his last loft bed that I made from two by fours and a scrap of plywood. Um, we do love him, uh, despite <laughs> his furniture <laughs> anyway. So, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, he, this is his design. So any oh, okay. any resemblance to a coffin is so, seemingly making him feel cozy. I don't know. So the, 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 it's it's also four feet off the ground, right? So the next step is to build um, boxes that will also have that will have drawers in them, and those will be the steps to get in there. So the plan is to have three steps about twenty inches tall, and that'll get him to the top of the mattress pretty comfortably. So. Um, it's all very exciting here. We're, we're keeping busy. And I got to say, this is the first project that uh, I, I've like made Liam be my helper. And, and that involves a lot of um, tongue biting on my part and extreme <laughs> patience on his. So <laughs> he's a huge help. If, you know, I, I physically at this point in my life can't lift, you know, sheets of plywood by myself safely. So um it's good to have a young man to help me. So, should we take some questions? What do you guys think? Yes. Why not? All right. This comes from Mike from Richmond. What up, FHB gurus? I have a natural <laughs> gas furnace and AC whole house unit for a one-story, 1,750-square-foot ranch. I'm looking at replacing the 20-year-old AC unit. The unit is in the garage with the outdoor unit that bakes in the sun for most of the day. I, I built a four foot tall fence to help hide the unit and provide some shade. It doesn't seem to be blocking, doing much to block the sun. What are your thoughts on relocating the outdoor unit on the far end of the house where it will be in the shade 100% of the time? The current outdoor unit is about 25 feet from the coil. The additional distance would be about 25 feet for new length, for a total length of about 50 feet. I'm not sure about what this would cost. The crawl space has a decent amount of room to get around in. So, do the gurus think it would be worth the additional cost to to run power and tubing to the outdoor unit? Or am I overthinking this like I normally do? Thanks for the awesomeness of your show. Mike from Richmond, Virginia. Wow, this is a good question. So, his Mm -hmm. question in a nutshell is, getting this outdoor unit out of the sun, is it going to save him money? Enough money, in fact, to pay for the cost to move this thing when he replaces the unit. Oh, we've lost Kylie again. Hmm. No, oh, no, you're there. still there. Okay, my bad. <laughs> she's just not moving. <laughs> so, what do you guys think of this? Something. Does this make Does this make sense? Does this Is it worth moving this outdoor unit to get it out of the sun? Go ahead, Matt. I know you have got strong feelings on this. I don't know if I have strong feelings on it. I would say it's not worth moving the existing one out of the sun. Maybe if you're gonna, you know, get a new system, you can put it out of the sun. You know, when you and get that one installed but there's not really much savings from getting those things out of the sun as far as i understand i mean it's mostly 
the air temperature that you're concerned with and the air on the shady side of the house, the ambient temperature of the air is exactly the same as on the sunny side of the house. Like you feel hot when you're in the sun, but the air temperature is, is the same, whether it's in the sun or the shade. So the, the unit itself might be a little warmer, but that the temperature of the box itself doesn't really play much of a role in the compressor and heat exchanger's ability to get the heat out of that uh, refrigerant. I bet that's news to a lot of people. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> it, I mean, it stands to reason if it's hot, it, you know. I yeah, just... well, I mean, the way these things work, uh, you know, the compressor essentially is raising the temperature of the of the coolant gas yeah of well yeah it turns it basically back into a liquid and compresses it raises the temperature and then when it goes uh past the expansion valve um you know it expands again the phase change results in a temperature drop and that's you know basically what ends up cooling your house that goes through another heat exchanger and you know the it sucks the heat out of the air that's passing over that heat exchanger turns that, raises the temperature of that gas again, and then it goes back and cycles back through again. So the the fact that the outdoor unit is hot, I mean, it's intentionally hot for one, <laughs> but like the additional um, energy coming from the sun isn't really doing that much to my understanding to, to really, you know, affect its performance. I think to understand this the, most easily is the outdoor unit is using huge amounts of air with a big fan yeah. and that's what's cooling the coils and it's the sun has very little effect on it and this isn't just what matt and i say and i did enjoy matt's explanation of the refrigeration cycle that was awesome um but this has been researched and the florida energy systems consortium did a study and uh, and uh i'll link a green building advisor uh, blog post that discusses this very subject uh, is part of the podcast page. So here's what the study says. We conclude that any savings produced by localized AC condensing shading are quite modest, less than 3%, and that the risk of interrupting airflow to the condenser may outweigh shading considerations. So what they were specifically studying is like putting an umbrella or an enclosure over your outdoor unit to uh, shade it. Um, so... The preferred strategy may be a long-term one, locating the AC condenser in an unobstructed location on the shaded north side of buildings, and depending on extensive site and neighborhood level landscaping to lower localized air temperatures. So if you can put it in some place that the air temperature is lower, you are likely to see a boost of efficiency. I think it would be very hard to quantify the savings, and I think it would be very hard to justify moving in an existing unit uh, and maybe replacing it, as Matt suggests, it might make sense, but I would spend that money doing something else to improve the efficiency of your house rather so than... That's, that's sort of interesting to me that yeah, oftentimes you see people plant, speaking of arborvitae, you'll see like a ring of arborvitae around a unit. Do you think they're trying to... And plants, don't they lower the air temperature? So wouldn't that, wouldn't that stand a reason that that might bring it down? Not that it results in cost savings, but... I just see that a lot. You see units surrounded by planted evergreens. If I had to guess, Kylie, I would say that is more a Aesthetic. method of screening. Yeah. Because, you know, unlike myself, some people find the outdoor air conditioning unit to be unattractive. <laughs> right. um, That's what I, I always assumed know. it was for, but I don't know. Maybe there's there's more to it. Maybe not. Um, there so may I'll... be, but, I mean, it, you really don't want to restrict that airflow. Mm -hmm. And if those plants are in some way preventing that or create, you know, creating almost like a system where the, that air that's been heated going through that exchanger, um, ends up cycling back into it. It could be more detrimental. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll fry the, the motor, right? If, if it's not getting sufficient airflow, it's gonna, it's gonna, yeah. and the potentially the compressor too. All right. Our next question comes from Adam from Virginia. Hello all. I'm starting a new concrete patio project, that, and I could use your help. The size will be roughly 12 by 14 with an integrated concrete fire pit. I've designed the pad in sections separated by three inches of white stone. This serves two purposes. One, it's a nice decorative addition, and two, it allows 
me to pour the pad in small sections and focus, uh, focusing on one, finishing one area at a time. My biggest problem is removing the stumps and roots. I looked into renting an excavator. The rental place told me I need a 7,500 pound machine. My truck can't pull that and it would eat at my blacktop. So I'm having the stumps grinded down. The biggest stump is about 12 inches. The rest are single digits, 12 stumps in all. I'm hoping a three and a half inch pad with rebar will hold up to the decaying organic material. I have a concrete mixer, but no finishing tools. Any recommendation you have to help me along would be greatly appreciated. Adam in Virginia. Jeff, I'm going to ask you to take a stab at this first because <laughs> um, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go last. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so he can tell uh, us all we're wrong. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, well, first of all, I, I have rented a small excavator and they delivered it, but um, it had yeah, right. rubber treads. So it didn't really dig up the blacktop. Um, and based on the sinkholes I have in my front yard from some old stumps, I would try and get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you want to go next? Yeah, I mean, the, the longevity of any, any pad really depends on the soil below and, you know, the sub-base and whether you've compacted um, everything well. And organic soil to start with, you know, is it, you're going to want to get rid of all the topsoil. And if you've got those root systems and stumps in there, they're going to eventually rot away and then you're going to have a bunch of voids and i mean you really need to get all that stuff out of there completely if you want this to last for a really long time um and then depending on the kind of soil you have underneath i mean if it's not compactable soil you need to excavate quite a bit anyway and then put a sub base in there that you can compact uh, you know to be able to support the pad um the rebar is not going to be enough to sort of you know keep it from either cracking or sagging or whatever um, unless you did like a post tension slab and, you know, had some sort of footings or pilings to just kind of, you know, support that on the edges. But the fact that you want to segment this thing um, kind of negates that as a possibility, I think. So I don't know exactly what the solution would be, but it really depends on your soil type um, and how far you're able to ground that stuff down, I think. Well, if he Kylie, had it what are you going to say? Well, just to see if he had it professionally done. How far do those guys typically grind out a stump? I mean, do they get into the root zone or they just, how far down does it go? The idea is just to get it below the like established grade, right? So yeah. you can plant over it and you only need what, a couple inches of topsoil to grow grass in mo most cases. Yeah, so that's, that's not all what he's doing. That's not what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So he's got to get gonna, them out. You have to get these out mm -hmm. of here. You cannot build on or on stumps. And yeah. even if you have them ground out, they don't take out the roots when they grind mm -hmm. stumps. There's right. still like tons of organic material that's going to rot. And then your slab is either going to settle or it's going to break like Matt suggests. I mean, this you can't you can't pour concrete on this. I would say if you don't want to. And yes, they deliver equipment on on, on trailers, you don't need to tow it behind yeah. your truck. And yes, they have rubber treads, so they don't destroy asphalt. It's actually a very good machine to use on established asphalt or concrete for this very reason. And the treads inside of tires spread out the load a lot. So you're not putting as severe a point load on, on your existing landscape or on your flat work. So, yeah. Uh, if you don't want to deal with all the roots and the stumps, build a deck, yeah. you know, then you're talking about localized footings and you're talking about removing, you know, one or two or five stumps instead yeah. of, you know, all of them. I think that's a great idea. And, and, and as Matt suggests, you need to uh, get the topsoil off. And if you're going to do digging to pull all this stuff out of here, you've messed up the subsoil. So you're going to have to compact this in, you know, six or 12 inch lifts. Um, so if you're not going to build a deck, I'd say hire someone to do the site work because it's way more than you're thinking it's going to be. Yeah. yeah. If you haven't taken those trees out, I mean, a better way to get rid of trees when you're doing a project like this is to just push them over so that it rips up the whole root system and everything mm -hmm. while it's happening. I mean, when you see guys, you know, out doing site work for a big building or whatever, they're not cutting down land the trees. Land clearing, right, Yeah, the land clearing 
they're going out there with an excavator and just pushing the trees over. Huh. Yeah, or they cut them off and they leave like a four foot stump. Yeah. You need that right, so lever to it. then yep. push over with a machine. Right. Uh, I think people who are inexperienced with this cut them too low and and then you you're physically you're digging them out. Stuck with the right. roots. Yeah. I have a couple anecdotes to explain this uh, problem. Um, my neighbor's house was built about 20 years ago, and it's on a very steep site. And the driveway goes up in front of the house at a pretty steep angle, and it curves around to the garage. And um, several years ago, we started noticing a sinkhole in the center of their driveway. And what had happened was the original builder had buried a huge stump in the driveway, which is like the lowest thing you can do because... <laughs> It takes 20 years for it to decay to the amount that it shows up with as subsidence. Mm -hmm. And so these folks had to dig this stump out and several others and then fill the huge hole with gravel and then repave. And it cost yeah. tens of thousands of dollars. Oh, so, it's terrible. you know, the stakes are high with this kind of stuff. Um, when I was building my barn, Andy Engel was my excavator. You know, Andy has a loader backhoe. And we were digging the um, footings from my post-frame barn that I'm actually standing and talking to you all in from. And there was probably a three-foot diameter stump that was at the bottom of one of these holes. And Andy's machine is pretty big, but not huge. And he was not able to yank this thing out of the ground. So he probably spent an hour digging all the way around it to the point where he could pick up one side and kind of roll it out of the hole. Oh, but um, you have to do that. And then because this thing was so deep, I had to make that footing much deeper because we had disturbed the soil around it. So uh, site work is not pretty, but it is sure important. <laughs> so supposing this guy doesn't get rid of the root zone, right? And he... He puts his pad down. What do you think the uh, the lifespan of that pad would be? I don't know. I don't know. It yeah, depends I mean, on how quickly it decays, and I bet it decays well, pretty quick yeah. in Virginia. Yeah, and I would think. I mean, if, depending on how small these sections are going to be, it you know they may not break, but they will shift and settle, and it will mm -hmm. be uneven, probably uneven, yeah. relatively quick. And I think the small sections actually exacerbates this yeah, problem. I right? wondered about that. Yeah. yeah. I've never and seen that done before. Have you? The way he's describing it? Um, I've seen it like outside of super modern houses. You know what I mean? Like, and it's yeah. always white stones between the concrete yeah, sections. Yeah, yeah. I can picture that. Mm -hmm. I guess that's true. Adam, uh, get the stumps out. Not doing so is a bad idea. Uh, this is from John from Southern California. Hi there. I just started listening to your podcast and love it. I was given the magazine as a gift and then resubscribed. I also bought an online membership. Well, thanks, John. Keeping yeah. the wheels turning here at uh, mm -hmm. Taunton Press. <laughs> as you can see below, I have an architectural rendering business. That means my eyes have been burned down on my skull for the past 12 <laughs> years from staring at a screen for a long stretches at a time. During busy periods, it's not unusual for me to pull at least one all-nighter a week. I'm 45 now. This wrecks me. Add this to my desire to actually work with my hands has brought me to a midlife craft crisis. <laughs> my career and work history up to this point have been varied and complex. I started working when I was 15, retail, mowing lawns, painting houses, whatever. I proceeded to become a reprobate until I was 23. During those formative and adventurous years, I worked menial positions in trades, and by that I mean digging ditches and stuff. When I got my act together at 23, I ran a cafe, built a new one for the owner and met an electrician who hired me. I left the cafe at the same time, applied for architecture school. During my education, I worked as a helper to a bunch of trades to make extra cash. This means I saw a lot of stuff around job site, but I never became skilled at any one of them. After architecture school, I worked briefly for a well-known firm, but never really got into the nuts and bolts of architecture. We did a lot of high-end public buildings and competitions, and because of an arts background, I ended up doing a lot of renderings. There's a common misconception that architects make money. <laughs> this is patently false. <laughs> <laughs> For educational investment to income ratio, you couldn't make a worse choice. <laughs> I ended up starting my own business thinking I'd get into design build, but I quickly wound up doing renderings as that was the only thing people were willing to pay me decent money for. 
I usually work on large scale projects because there just isn't a budget for high quality images and residential work. The only residential project I did was a renovation of John Latner's silver top house in Los Angeles. Have you guys seen this place? No, I, I did. It it's, you'd love it, Kylie. Yeah. It's like mid century modern, just like amazing house. It's amazing. Look it up. So there's a, a link on the podcast page for those of you listening. You should definitely check it out because it is some jaw dropping modern architecture. My great desire is to own my own custom spec design build firm. I'm lacking in many skill areas. I do not want incentive sit in front of a computer for the remainder of my life, but I'm also 45, which means starting out as an entry-level carpenter might not be realistic. I could try to get a job with a contractor, but I don't have enough experience to be a foreman. What would your suggestion to be set to set me on my desired path? I've worked for myself for a long while, so working for someone else might not be possible. I might not be attractive to a potential boss. Unfortunately, Southern California has a forgiving climate, and you wouldn't believe what passes for a de detailing a house here, and I don't actually know what it really should be. Think flashing? We don't need no stinking flashing. <laughs> Are there schools in Los Angeles that teach people proper building practices? Soup to nuts. Anyway, I basically just wrote a whole podcast, so sorry for the long email. <laughs> Your suggestion would be appreciated. Well, John, thanks. We're trying to fill time around here, so I do appreciate the lengthy letter. <laughs> No, I think that is a fantastic question, yeah. and I'm going to start off here because I would say John's career path um, is very similar to my own in the fact that uh, I was around a lot of stuff, never got really good at it. So I would tell John the one thing he's probably qualified to do is to be a fine home building magazine editor, <laughs> but um, that's going to be tough to score one of those jobs right now. I love it. So Yeah, making a career change is not easy. <laughs> It's not easy, especially when you have to pay the bills, right? Yeah, that's probably the hard part. I mean, if you are able to take a couple years off, I mean, you can take the path that I sort of did <laughs> and go to trade school. <laughs> um, I mean, there's all kinds of programs, and I'm, I know that there are programs in California. I had thought about uh, applying to one. I ended up not doing that because I, I didn't really want to go to California that bad. But um yeah, I mean, there are programs for all kinds of things. I mean, you could look at residential construction. You could, could look at construction management. Um, you're going to make a lot more money in construction management uh, right out of the gate than you will, uh, you know, building. Uh, you know, it, you probably won't be doing as much with your hands. Um, you're going to be doing probably a lot of math, a lot of spreadsheets, a lot of estimates and stuff like that. But, I bet that's exactly um, what he wants to do, Matt, is a lot of math right. and spreadsheets and, so, and staring at a computer. Right. <laughs> so you're going to end up, but I mean, you may end up on job sites and, you know, I, I don't know, but yeah, I mean, if you, I don't think you're probably going to make a ton of money right out the gate, um, you know, as a builder, as a, as a newbie. Um, but I don't know, I don't know what the market's like there. So, you know, it, California's expensive, Southern California, very expensive. Um, but I mean, it's definitely doable. I mean, if you being as old as you are and ha having a strong interest, if you went to a trade school, you'd probably be more engaged and get more out of it than any of the younger people will. I would say that was my experience anyway. So Matt, what? tell me honestly, if you had to do it over again, would you go to Delhi for the construction management program a second time? Uh, well, I went for the residential construction program. So mine was the basically a hands-on, you know, it was essentially trade school. Um, would I stay on for an additional two years for the construction management portion? Probably, I don't know. It depends. I mean, well, would you take the same program really had... again? Oh, would I do the same program I did? Absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, in my situation, you know, I had the GI Bill, so it was paid for, you know, so I didn't really have much in terms of expenses. I lived in a very inexpensive part of the world. Um, you know, my rent was like $700 a month, um, you know, so it wasn't. I. Uh, if I didn't have that, it wouldn't have happened, I don't think. But that said, I mean, I'd also saved up some money and, and I, I did have that cushion and I was able to do that. So I think if you have that cushion and that interest, 
I think it's totally worth giving it a shot. And I mean, coming out of school, you're not going to be making as much money as some guy who's been doing the job for 20 years. But if you're really paying attention um, and putting as much as you can into your education, um, when you come out, you, even if you start low, um, if you're, if you have a lot of skills, you can probably advance pretty quickly. Do you think that skills USA would serve this guy in any capacity? Could he make, make use of that program without being an established student? Although I did find, I don't know if it's in LA specifically, but the California department of education has a building and construction trades program that has a specifically cabinetry, millwork, and woodworking path. There's like four different things that they offer. But I was mm-hmm. thinking about Skills USA. Is there any way to get involved and get hands on skills through that organization, or do you have to be affiliated with a school program to start? I don't know. Everybody that I know who's been involved in that has been in a in some kind of a school mm-hmm. program. Mm-hmm as far as I know. Um, and I, I did participate in that when I was in school too. And everybody that, you know, I was competing against were all, you know, already. people from mm-hmm. other schools. So, and I've gone to the nationals, uh, a couple times just to, to basically watch that. And, uh, all those guys, all those, uh, students are in schools and it, that's a great program. Um, but it's everything. I mean, it's, it, trades it's you know cosmetology it's you know everything that you could imagine that you could you know go to school for that's a trade pretty much they have a a competition for well, it they have competitions cool but they see. also have training programs don't they yeah i that's the thing i never saw any of that side of I it think they, i think they do that probably exists but i haven't participated in any of that what do you think jeff what what should john do um, I, I just because he's starting at 45, I would think about, you know, a more technical thing, uh, you know, something like HVAC or because um, of his body. Yeah, yeah more or less. Yeah, because yeah. that's something you can, you know, if you're not if your body's not accustomed to it, it's going to take you a long time to be able to, you know, do that all day. Yeah, especially since back. he's been I mean, sitting in a chair. Runner. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I know what it does to me. Cause... <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. all of us. You know, John, I've had these thoughts for the last 10 years of my life, and I'm about your age. I'm a little older. Um, you know, I always wanted to be an electrician. And uh, sometimes I think about it now, like, well, how my life would be different. Um, but it's very scary to change jobs. And I'm very blessed that my job suits my uh, attention deficit disorder to a T because I get to do so many different things. And largely I get to decide, um, my schedule, you know what I'm saying? So I'm very lucky. I, and I, to satisfy my need for handcraft, I'm voracious on the home projects. I just, that's, that's my creative outlet. I love the problem solving associated with that, especially when you're working with, a limited budget and existing conditions, you get real creative. And I love that about uh, handcraft that it gives me that outlet. So I don't know that I have any good advice for you. You're a fantastic uh, artist. I I looked at your website and, you know, it's going to be tough for you to make as much money as you do, given how skilled you are at what you do. Um, I might tell you to try volunteering at Habitat for Humanity just to scratch that itch. But if you really want a career change, um, you're going to have to get some training no matter, you know, what climate, how forgiving it is. And I'm always an advocate of learning on the job. So if you have use your architect connections to find the good builders and learn from them and hope you can climb the ladder quickly and given the at least before the outbreak, the tr- skilled labor shortage, you know, you could advance pretty quickly. So, you know, I didn't learn much in school. I learned a lot on the job. So my experience is probably different than Matt's. So Kylie, you've changed careers yeah. at least once I know of. Mm-hmm. What do you think about this? Yeah, I appreciated this guy's question because that serendipitous route to the thing that you love can be long and winding. Um, 
I did that. My body was breaking down. I was a gardener. For, Tell folks you were a gardener. Yeah, yeah, I was a professional gardener for 22 years. And my I was in excruciating pain all the time and realized at 38 that by the time I was 40, I needed to be doing something different um, and set my sights on an editorial career. Um, and I did what Matt did. I went to a trade school for, you know, I already had a BA and I went back for a, an associate's in science and, and landscape construction. And um, uh, it took, I just paid my final bill. <laughs> my final bill. <laughs> and uh, so it's all paid for. And uh, I, th- I-, I think it served me really well, actually. I'm, I'm very happy with, with the opportunities that it presented to have done that. But, but, but anyway, long on the sort of the, sh- I, 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 that was to get into my career as a horticulturist. Then when I made a decision, I thought, well, that program served me really well. I'm going to do that again. And I found a nine month um, editorial writing and certificate kind of program at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I did that. And that was an excellent program. In nine months, I worked my tail off. And then after that, I did all kinds of free, it said no to nothing. And I found avenues for putting together experience. And uh, you just it's doable. I'm here to say you can do it. And I, hmm. I think, um, there's lots of, you just got to do the research and find out like Matt's program is, is so stellar in, in the, in that it, I just have always been impressed with how much you glean from it and how you've put it to use. And I, I think those things are out there for people. You just got to really put your time in. Yeah. Uh, it's a great question, John. I'm going to ask our, our listeners, um, some of you may have gone through this. We'd love to hear your experience and what you would tell John to do. Um, I, I, you know, some of our questions have an easy answer. This is one that definitely doesn't. But I think a lot of people think about it. Yeah. Changing, I, changing careers. You know, on a beautiful day, especially, mm-hmm. I think, God, I would love to be outside working on something. Um, and I still get that feeling, but... I'm lucky that I, I can do it in, in other ways. And, and as Jeff pointed out, like at a point, your body uh, can't take work in construction, you know, every day mm-hmm. easily. Some people can, but my, my friend told me one time, he's like, you know, if you're in this business long enough, you will be crippled. Yeah. And uh, that's a sad statement, but it's very true. Um, this is from... Andrew in Wisconsin, we are removing our rat slab basement floor. Do you guys know what a rat slab is? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's real thin concrete. It's just meant to keep the critters out. Um, and I want to pour a new slab with a perimeter drain underneath leading to a sump basin. We intended to put down two inches of foam and a 15 or 20 mil vapor barrier under the concrete floor. My question is, should the foam be under the vapor barrier? And what should I do around the hole where the well pipe comes in? The basement currently has water issues due to a high water table. So this comes from Andrew in Wisconsin. And unlike our last question, which doesn't have an easy answer, this one definitely does. And <laughs> the <laughs> plastic layer goes directly under the concrete. Yeah. Do you know why I do this? know this, Matt? I'm going to ask you. I'm going to guess that you put blotter sand on top of your <laughs> <laughs> no. on top of your poly? No. <laughs> so Matt is referring to uh, it was once... Well, it might still be practiced somewhere and by some people, but you put layer of sand on top of the poly and the, 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 the rationale is that it, it sucks up the excess water in the concrete. And the only problem was it is then the sand is saturated with water and gives it off for decades mm. uh, and it, if it ever dries. Anyway, so don't use blotter sand. But I did this incorrectly. I put my plastic under the foam. And for mm. the same reason, it's it's a problem. Is now the interstitial spaces between the foam panels hold all the water, and it takes a decade or more for it to evaporate. So, um, I put photographs of my poorly installed plastic <laughs> under my barn slab on the podcast page. So those of you who are listening can make fun of me. But I d- did later learn that I did it backwards. Mm. But it says it hasn't seemed to affect it anything really. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it'll it, you'll mostly notice, I think, it being a problem if you try to put some sort of finished flooring on top of that. Mm. Then right you're away. either going to get either right away or within, you know, before that water has a chance to dry out of there. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it it will, you know, ruin 
ruin a lot of flooring. What's the flooring so. in your barn, Patrick? Is it just slab? It's just concrete. Mm. It's lovely, Kylie. <laughs> I'm sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> you must have been Don't so, judge. You must have been so angry at yourself when you realized that, though. Oh, my God. So I made a big deal. You know, I, I blog, blogged about my barn construction for, you know, the two and a half years yeah. I was building it. And I put those photos up there. And you know what? No one ever said a word. I don't know if they didn't know any better, but <laughs> um, it is a textbook <laughs> of what not to do. <laughs> this guy, he was also asking about what should you do around the hole where the well comes in. Yeah. I have no idea. You want to take that? Well, I, I don't know that he needs to do anything special. I mean, the main thing... The poly well, he's got to seal the hole because it's letting in bulk water. If it's if it's letting in bulk water, yes, then you need to do something to seal around that. But I mean, as far as the vapor barrier, I mean, you can put tons of holes in that poly, and it's still going to do the majority of its job. So that's not really an issue. So um, the well pipe and the conduit, and I don't think that's the right conduit to use actually in the photograph. But anyway, um, those those should be sleeve that means a plastic pipe should be put around those so they could be replaced in the future if they need to be sometimes you need to to snake a, a new pipe or a conduit through or a cable and um and then that should be sealed to the concrete or the the foundation wall with hydraulic cement is what i like to use because it sets up so quick and then you seal the inside the pipe with something that can be cut out or or pulled out later on like Cicaflex and or silicone and you know and then you seal that the pipes penetration that way but um if you don't think you're going to have to renew those pipes you could just pour the concrete over it like most people in the trades would do <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think about uh that whole thing with like I'm, I'm pleased to see that he's going to put insulation under his concrete slab. It seems like very few people are willing to go the extra step and, and spend the money and effort to, to do that. It's, I think that's a, a wise choice. Yeah. You can't do it later. Well, he's doing it a little bit later. <laughs> but he has <laughs> right. to go through yeah. and tear out that entire rat slab. And that's not fun. All right, folks, so hold tight. This is another long question. This comes from Joel. Hello, FHB crew. I recently finished my walkout basement in our ranch house in Michigan while finishing every single back episode of the FHB podcast. <laughs> Boy, you are desperate for content, Joel, I tell you. <laughs> and I'm having some issues with being quite with the space being quite a bit colder in the fall, winter, spring than my upstairs. It's a pretty big difference in the spring and fall and less of a difference in the winter. There is a small unfinished sl utility slash storage area on the southernmost side of the house where we have our water heater and forced air HVAC system. There's two finished bedrooms with carpet, a living room with floating vinyl floor tile, a small finished walk-in storage closet, a small bathroom, and the last 25% is my unfinished workshop. So I'm going to stop right there. Part of the reason I picked Joel's question here is because I wanted an excuse to show Joel's workshop. And when he describes it as unfinished, I don't think that is a fair characterization. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is a lovely space, and uh, I would never leave there if it were mine. Um, the small workshop back wall is all spray foam with closed cell foam, but the side wall remains the concrete foundation. The rest of the walls in the finished area also spray foam with closed cell, as is the rim joist. The master bedroom on the main floor also remains quite a bit colder as it is the furthest from the furnace. There are only two dampers in the utility area that go to the main floor laundry and main floor hallway. I turn those off in the winter, but is closing two dampers and some vents upstairs going to increase the static pressure too much and damage my equipment by not working at 100% capacity? I've heard of bypass ducts, but not sure that applies or is a good solution. If you need inf more info, please ask, but I'm looking for ways to fix this problem so we don't have to freeze at night in our master bedroom and we want to spend more time in the basement. I would too. Hey, I'm, a, I'm a woodworker slash finished carpenter that spent a lot of time building out down there and my family doesn't want to spend any time in it. Um, we resorted to space heaters to get the space somewhat comfortable. Do I need to have it zoned, install additional dampers? All the ductwork was done to code, inspected, and signed off by the township, so I don't think the problem lies there. There also isn't much space for a mini split, and I doubt the township would allow a wood stove in the basement. The furnace is 15 years old, so should I just get a new one with variable speed to allow it to be zoned properly? What do you guys think? 
Any suggestion would be welcome. Bam. I don't know, man. It seems like there's a lot going on there. <laughs> One, I mean, is the furnace sized to be able to, you know, take on this additional space? Um, does he have a thermostat down there? I mean, you know, there may be a reason that there's not any heat getting down there if the furnace doesn't know that it's cold. Um, I don't know. I mean, you probably have a lot more thoughts on this than I do. I don't I don't like forced air systems. Yeah. Um, you know, I you first need to figure out is, is it a problem of capacity or air delivery? And the easiest way to determine that is to get a manometer from Amazon for 40 bucks or $25, check the air delivery to all the registers. The idea is to get them having about the same amount of air coming out. Obviously larger spaces, you want more air delivery, smaller spaces, you want less. And the he, I think in, the, in part of his email, nailed the, the likely problem in my mind is that the furnace is the way other end of the house, right? So it, it, it's all the air is used up by the time it makes it to the other end. So you need to, to tone it back. And as I suggest, closing the dampers might be a good suggestion. But as he also suggests, if you do close off too much, you're not getting enough airflow through the, the, the um, heat exchanger. And if it overheats, it can damage the furnace or cause other problems. So um, my suggestion would be to find a good HVAC contractor. And that's difficult. Um, you might be better served by contacting first a company that does... Um, home performance evaluations. And um, they can either refer you to an HVAC company or they often figure out these kind of problems themselves. But it's going to take some diagnostics work. And um, duct work, frankly, is seldom done well. And it can be inspected. And I saw in the, fo in the photographs he sent us that the duct seams are all sealed, which indicates good practice. But from every takeoff, which means from every heat run to every register, you need to be incrementally sizing down the ductwork to maintain the airflow going along. You can sometimes keep the airflow consistent with, with, uh, with dampers, but that has its own trade-offs, as he indicated. So you really need somebody who's more knowledgeable than us and who can see the, what situation you're dealing with. If you want to dive into this yourself, I'd say get the, the anemometer. Am I saying that right, Matt? Manometer? Manometer, an airspeed meter. I think uh, that's what it's called, yeah. And, 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 you know, you hold it up to the different registers and see what your airflows are. If they're vastly different uh, for similar size spaces, you, you start there. And oftentimes the registers can be closed to, uh, to boost the airflow to the others. So give it a try. What do you got to lose? And when he says he doesn't have room for a mini split... I mean, there must be one wall. I mean, you can put them anywhere, right? But you have to get the refrigeration and the electric line outside. So maybe that's the difficulty. Mm. And um, I don't know. Spend time in your shop. <laughs> Let the family stay upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I saw on the... Uh, Why do you think that is, Patrick? Why do you think it's so hard to get a good HVAC guy out? God, Kylie, that's the question for the ages. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't really know. It's a common, I, I think it's, common problem. So we've had, you know, centuries to, to figure out plumbing, right? We've had at least as long figuring out carpentry, right? We've had since the 50s and 60s before air conditioning even existed, and then it was rare. Only probably in the 80s or 90s did air conditioning get super mainstream. And, you know, when ducts leak, like, there's not drips. You don't mm -hmm. notice. You don't, know. you don't, you don't care. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's, and you know, comfort problems were, were something that people just used to accept. Um, people were less accepting of comfort problems. So our HVAC industry needs to up its game, but I don't think the training is there is the simple answer. And it's, it's unfortunate that, um, HVAC contractors often, let's call them like, furnace salesman. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's seriously, if, you, if your furnace is 15 or 20 years old, 
no one's going to tell you to fix it. They're going to say, you know, the in, 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 if efficiency improvements justify you're putting a new furnace in. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the role is to sell you a new furnace. And they offer, you know, uh, financing and they'll, they'll throw in air conditioning uh, at the same time. And all of a sudden, you know, like they're, they're making a real sale. If you're, if you're spending two or three hundred dollars to, to fix your furnace, the, the tradesperson is not taking home a lot of money in reality, right? So, you know, I think there are market problem, market force problems and education problems that drive the mediocre HVAC industry. Thanks. And for people those guys. like Matt don't want it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, Matt. But I mean, going back to the, you know, the guy who wanted to change careers, I mean, like if you're going into HVAC, those guys, if you're, if you're good, you're pretty much printing money. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a great career to go into. Why do you say that, Matt? Why, what makes you think that trade is different than others? I don't know that it's necessarily different than others, but I mean, I don't think that you're going to have trouble finding a job. I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, like, especially on the commercial side, um, you know, those things are getting serviced or replaced constantly. So... I would point out too that ductwork is way lighter than like cast iron pipe or LVLs or, you know, I mean like furnaces are heavy, but you move them on a dolly, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you have to boost an air handler up in the attic, but you have, you know, either equipment to lift it or a helper or, you know what I mean? So, so Joel the... should go, what's, the, what's that guy's name? Wants to make his, needs to look into the HVAC Joel. line. Yeah. Oh, no, that would be <laughs> a uh, career. Uh, John needs to, 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 to explore the HVAC career. Yeah. yeah. So man, uh, Joel, use your, you know, contacts in the business. If you're, a, if you're a carpenter to find the, the good HVAC people, and you probably know who they are, if you guys are building new houses, um, you can tell the difference oftentimes by the amount of noise and cussing they make as they work. <laughs> So on the um, Facebook uh, group that I follow regularly, um, I saw this photograph, and then someone else sent it to me. <laughs> I, I almost uh, sent it to, to, to the you podcast. Too. Yeah, so. <laughs> Everybody thought of you. <laughs> Kylie, do you want to describe what's going on in this photograph that oh, I'm talking a, about? Are you talking about the the vent, the, yeah. the roof vent with no hole in the roof? <laughs> <laughs> Placed on top of the asphalt shingles. <laughs> yeah, that's classic. So we've talked. <laughs> We've talked a lot on the show about why um, roof venting doesn't work, right? Uh, oftentimes, there's not enough soffit to ridge vent. Oftentimes, the roof is cut up in a certain way. Oftentimes, it doesn't have enough pitch. But uh, not having actual holes cut in the roof is not one of the things we've talked about. But apparently, that is another uh, roof venting problem that you can experience. Did you see this one? No, I, <laughs> so, unfortunately, like I so keep getting a, kicked off the thing. Matt, it's a it's a mushroom vent, right? It's uh -huh. probably like two foot in <laughs> diameter, and the guy has it picked up from the roof, and there's like just like shingles like running underneath it, and, like <laughs> it's stuck it on there. Sounds it's like hilarious. something from like it's the Road Runner, just like yeah. painting a, a <laughs> painting an opening on the side of a mountain so the coyote will run into it. <laughs> a purely oh God, decorative mushroom vent. Yeah, who would do that? Because they are beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm pretty sure I know what happened is that the homeowner, like, you know, at the end of the job said to the roofer, well, you didn't put the roof vents on that we talked about. And he's like, oh, man, you're right. So he goes up there and just stucks it, sticks the one edge under the shingle and puts some tar <laughs> on it. That's horrible. That's so bad. <laughs> oh, man. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Jeff, Kylie, and Matt for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com, and please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. And please be sure to tune in to the uh, Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast, which comes out every Wednesday. We're talking to uh, industry professionals about various topics. Uh, coming up is Peter... Nope. I forget. Anyway, never mind. Check out my <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Surprise <Thank> guest. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody.